Jonah, but first starting with the last verse of chapter 3. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, Please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. Praise God for his magnificent word. Amen. Amen. Should we pray? Let's just pray as we, we come to God's word now. Father God, we are thankful that you have not left us without a guide in this world. But Lord, as we celebrate today, the day of Pentecost, we remember that you have not just sent us a written word, but you have sent us your Holy Spirit to be a light and to be a guide for us all through this life. That there is no such thing as a blind alley for us that are led by the Spirit. Lord, we do pray today, as we now look to your word, that you, Father, would use that Spirit within us to help us to see what it is that you're saying to us. Lord God, we pray that you would just rise up and give us that childlike enthusiasm today to encounter you afresh. We thank you, Lord, that even though we may have been Christians three, even four decades, that today is a new day and that today is a good day for a fresh encounter with you. We pray that you'd help me, Lord God, to preach your word as it is and that, Lord, I would not get in the way of what you're trying to say here to your beloved people. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I'm going to read to you to begin with a segment of a story that was part of Corrie ten Boom's 
life story. How many of you have heard of Corrie ten Boom? Corrie ten Boom was a Dutch prisoner of war. In the Second World War, she was imprisoned at Ravensbrück concentration camp, uh, where her sister sadly passed away, but Corrie ten Boom survived. And this is an account that she tells from those days after the Second World War had finished. Let me read to you. It was in a church in Munich that I saw him. A balding, heavy-set man in a grey overcoat. A brown felt hat clutched between his hands. People were filing out of the basement room where I had just spoken, moving along the rows of wooden chairs to the door at the rear. It was 1947, and I had come from Holland to defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. It was the truth they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land, and I gave them my favourite mental picture. Maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind, I like to think that that's where forgiven sins were thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God casts them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. There were never questions after a talk in Germany in 1947. People stood up in silence, in the silence connect, collected their wraps, in silence left the room. And that's when I saw him, working his way forward against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, the next, a blue uniform and a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man. I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment skin. Betsy, how thin you were. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me. Hand thrust out. A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take that hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among those thousands of women? But I remembered him and the leather crop swinging from his belt. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrück in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard in there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there. But I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fraulein. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? And I stood there. I whose sins had every day to be forgiven and could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out. But to me it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition. That we forgive those who have injured us. 
If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. I knew it not only as a commandment of God, but as a daily experience. Since the end of the war, I had had a home in Holland for victims of Nazi brutality. Those who were able to forgive their former enemies were able also to return to the outside world and to rebuild their lives, no matter what the physical scars. Those who nursed their bitterness remained invalids. It was as simple and as horrible as that. And still, I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me. I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried, with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Forgiving is not always easy. It's something that's often easier said than done. And it's easier, isn't it, to tell others who have been wronged or abused that they ought to forgive their enemies and that they ought to move on with their lives. But how much harder to forgive and how much harder to move on when you are the one who has been sinned against, when you are the one who has been wronged. Perhaps if the wrongdoer shows that they are sorry, they show that they are remorseful, and they apologize for their actions, then perhaps forgiveness becomes slightly easier. But what if they don't? What if they don't feel any remorse for what they have done? What then? Something deep within us, something very human, and I believe something of the image of God cries out within us for retribution. We want to see justice done. And when God here shows mercy to the Ninevites, Jonah's true feelings were laid bare to all. Verse 1 of chapter 4 tells us that God's decision to forgive the Ninevites displeased Jonah. It displeased him. In fact, that translation in the English it doesn't quite get to the heart of what Jonah was truly feeling. In the Hebrew, it literally says that what God had done was evil to Jonah. It was evil in Jonah's eyes. How incredible is that? We have here a man who has been so used of God who has led a whole city into revival, but he is ready to charge his God with doing evil. We must learn, brothers and sisters, once again, never to put men or women on pedestals. No matter how 
used of God they may be. All of us are debtors to the grace of God. No one is perfect. There is no such thing truly as a mighty man of God outside of the grace of God. Charles Spurgeon said, God uses people who fail, for there aren't any other kind of people around to use. Cy Tem Bruggenkate said, God is able to strike a straight blow with a crooked stick. Isn't that good news for you and I? All of us in this room today are, in one way, shape or another, crooked sticks with whom God uses to do great works. And Jonah was no different. This final chapter in, in Jonah that draws to conclusion everything that we've learned so far, this final chapter breaks down into three parts. The first part is verses 1 to 4. Verses 1 to 4. And this passage really breaks down Jonah's complaint. Jonah's grievance with God. Second part is verses 5 to 9. And this is Jonah's big sulk. Jonah has a big sulk outside the city of Nineveh. And that is covered in verses 5 to 9. And then finally, the third part, we have a question from God. God asks Jonah a question, and that is covered in verses 10 and 11. Let us turn our attention now briefly to the first part of this passage in verses 1 to 4. So if you will, let's turn our attention there. To me, one of the clearest evidences that the Bible truly is God's Word and not merely the words of men is that it is always unfailingly honest about the failings of mankind. If the Bible were truly just a book written by people trying to write about their God, we might expect there to not be so many embarrassing failures included within each and every book. There's only one man who escapes from Scripture without having his copy plate paper marked at all, and that's Jesus Christ. Though Jonah does fall back again in this passage into his same old sin of not trusting God, we do see something of an improvement in him compared with his behavior in chapter 1. This time, instead of running away from God, the first thing that Jonah does is that he prays to God. Even though this definitely has to be one of the most manipulative prayers that I have ever read in my life, we must still commend Jonah for praying at all. How many of you have prayed the odd manipulative prayer in your life? Though Jonah's prayer was far from perfect, we must see the hand of God working in his life that at least this time he didn't flee from God, but he turned to God in his anger. I've prayed many a manipulative prayer, just like Jonah here trying to pin his own disobedience upon God. Saying, God, you see now, Lord, you see now, Lord, why I fled to Tarshish, because I knew what you were like. I knew you were gracious. I knew you were merciful. I knew you were slow to anger. I knew you were rich in mercy, relenting from disaster. And therefore, I fled from this decree of yours. I fled as far as away as I could because I did not want you to have mercy on these horrible, sinful pagans here in this city. And you see now, God, what you've done. Jonah prayed a manipulative angry, prideful prayer. But God doesn't smite him. God doesn't even properly chide him. God asks him a simple question. Is it right for you, Jonah, to be angry? I, I want to say to you today that God is big enough 
and strong enough to handle you at your worst. He knows you're not perfect. He knows that full well. And he's gracious to you in your weaknesses, in your pain, in your grief, in your anger. God can handle your imperfect prayers too. And despite the awful, condescending tone of Jonah's prayer, he does tell us four incredible truths about God that I want to just take a moment and commend to you again today. Jonah prays and he says, God, I knew that you were firstly gracious and merciful. How many of you know today that God is gracious and merciful? Secondly, Jonah says that he is slow to anger. God is slow to anger. That means God's got a long fuse. That's good news for all of us. God's love is long-suffering. He's patient. He's kind. You know, I think the problem for many of us is that we don't realize how much patience God actually has to exercise with us because we're almost completely blind to our own failures and sinfulness. Just like a child that has to be told three, four, five, six, seven times to get their shoes on in the morning before school, time and time and time again. The child is unaware of how much patience is being tested, and it is so with you. You often do not realize how much you test the patience of God. But this is a good word here because it tells us that God is slow to anger, not quick. And I think there's many of us that need to hear that today. Perhaps we're living in shame. We're living with this constant feeling that God is displeased with us, that he's angry at us, that he's got a copy paper with every single one of our failings written on it from yesterday. And he wants the first time we wake up today to remind us again. Graham, do you remember how many times you failed me yesterday? I want to let you know that you used up 75% of your patience allotment yesterday. I know that many of you feel that way. You feel like God has a mark against you. He's got a card that he's keeping record of all your faults and failings and misdeeds. That's not true. God is slow to anger. He's gracious and kind. He's forgiving. And thirdly, Jonah tells us he's abounding in steadfast love. How many of you who were parents keep a record of all of your child's faults? To wake them up and remind them of them every day. How could we think that God would be like that? His love is abounding and steadfast. I don't know about you, but I know in my heart how much I fail God on a daily basis. And were it not for his love, were it not for the fact that I know he loves me, I don't think I could continue walking one foot in front of the other in this Christian journey. It's God's love that keeps you binded to him, not your love for him. Finally, Jonah says that God is relenting from disaster. When we think again about what God has done in this passage of Scripture, in not destroying the Ninevites, I don't think we quite understand how much of a miracle that is. We are talking about a people that were so brutal, so savage, so crass, so idolatrous, so wicked, that we can barely imagine it today. These men, when they invaded a city, permit me to just be graphic with you for a moment, when they invaded a city, they would break through the gates, 
The first couple that they found, they would keep alive as witnesses to what they were about to do. Afterwards, they would then skin, they would flay everybody alive and put the skins in a pile outside the city. They would then send that poor couple who had witnessed all of this, they would send them on to the next city to tell them what they'd just seen. These people were not nice people. They were not deserving of anything from God. And yet, God sent them a messenger. God sent them a messenger. And they repented and God relented from bringing disaster upon them. I want to remind you today that you can never run too far from the saving arm of God while you live in this world. I've met people on the streets that will tell that me, I'm too old to go to church now. I've done too much. You don't understand. If God can forgive these wicked Ninevites, then he can forgive you. No matter how much of a mess you've made of your life. Now Jonah, Jonah rejoiced in these truths just like you and I do. He loved those truths as they applied to him. But as they were applied to the Ninevites, these truths became evil. Evil in Jonah's sight. So much so that he wanted to die. Jonah thought that these people were not deserving of God's grace. And because they received God's grace, it kind of cheapened it for Jonah. It grieved him that God had forgiven these people, the last of all who should be receiving anything from the hand of God. And he became bitter. He became angry. What should have been a moment of great rejoicing in Jonah's life, he turned into a valley of self-pity and despair. I want to say that that's what pride and ingratitude will do to you. That's what pride and ingratitude will do to you. They will rob you of your joy. They will rob you of the joy of seeing what God is doing in your life. Because they'll want you to police what God is doing in everybody else's life. Oh God, it's, it's not fair. It's not fair, God. Look, I've been here serving you. I've been living my life as a Christian. I've been restraining myself from going out drinking and doing what all of my friends are doing. How can you show person to that person over there? How can you show favor to that person over there who's done none of that? They spent their whole lives living for themselves and then they turn to you one day and they say they're sorry and you're going to forgive them? What about me? It's not fair, God. That was Jonah's heart cry. That's the cry of somebody who has allowed bitterness and ingratitude to get a foothold. And doesn't it just show you as well that it's possible for somebody to be so used of God and so right in the middle of God's will, but simultaneously be bitter and angry and frustrated. Just because God chooses to use you in some mighty way, it doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you're not simultaneously broken and embittered and sinful. Again, I'll say, don't put people on pedestals. You know, I was in Nigeria in September last year, and one of the things that really shocked me was billboards right through the city of Abuja with pastors' faces on, like you'd see at the movies. You know, come see this church, and there'd be some big man of God on a poster like this. You know, and I'm just thinking, I don't know how wise that is. And we're not far away from that in this country as well. We love a hero. We love a champion. We love a big, strong man of God. 
But if this book tells us anything, it tells us that people are broken. People are complex. People can be mightily used of God and still be failing abjectly in another area of their life. So our trust must be in Christ, amen? And in Christ alone. Jonah had that same elder brother mentality, didn't he, from Jesus' parable of the, the lost son. Who, When the younger son returned and was forgiven by his father and welcomed back to the table, the elder brother wouldn't come in. He stayed out in the fields. He sulked. He was angry at his father. He had that same elder brother mindset. And don't be deceived, brothers and sisters, into thinking that that same mindset can't lay hold of you. There's an elder brother, in a sense, living within all of you. There's that one person that would really annoy you if they received God's grace and forgiveness and favor. You know who I'm talking about. Some of you know, as soon as I say that, you've got a picture of that person's face. I'd be happy for anyone else to receive God's favor apart from that guy or that woman or that boss at work who was so horrendous to me or that teacher that shouted at my children and was so mean to them. I'd, I'd be happy to see anyone else arrive in church on Sunday apart from them. God, please, you wouldn't do that to me, would you, Lord? That's that elder brother mindset. And let me say to you, we all have it. And we all need God's grace to defeat it. And each three of these sections, each three of them ends with God asking a question. Firstly, he asks him, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah doesn't respond. He goes outside of the town and builds himself a booth. Then God asks him, is it right for you to be angry about the plant that is now gone? And, and he said, yes, it's right for me to be angry, even unto death. <laughs> Jonah really throws a tantrum, doesn't he? It's good news for me because I'm a tantrum thrower. I always have been. I'm a tantrum thrower. And so here we've got a guy that received God's grace who was also a tantrum thrower. Um, very childish. And God asks him a final question about the Ninevites. He says, you didn't do anything to bring that plant up to bring you shade. And now you grieve that it's gone. Is it not right for me to show mercy to 120,000 in the city of Nineveh who don't know their right hand from their left? God asks questions in scripture, doesn't he? But why does God ask questions if he knows everything? If God is infinitely knowledgeable... And as the book of Isaiah says, that he declares the end from the beginning. Why do we find God asking questions? When God asks questions in scripture, he's not asking because he doesn't know something. He's asking questions in order to give whoever he is questioning an opportunity. An opportunity to search themselves. Whenever God enters into questioning with his creation, it's never usually a good sign. The first thing that Adam and Eve heard after they'd sinned in the garden was what? A question. Where are you? Where are you? Did God know where they were? I should think he knew where they were. And then in the book of Job, God asks a series of questions of Job, probing questions do you think God knew the answer to those questions I think that he did and then we find Christ being questioned by the Pharisees and the scribes and what does Christ do in response he asks them questions and even the apostle Paul in the book of Romans 9 responds to those who question God's sovereignty and salvation. 
In Romans 9, 18 to 21, it says, So then he who has mercy on whomever he wills and hardens whomever he wills, will you say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? God asks questions in order to give us a chance to reflect. Jonah wasn't in a reflective mood. He builds himself a booth outside of the city. That wasn't where he was supposed to be. Jonah was supposed to be in the city with the people who he'd just ministered to. But here we find him outside of the city builds himself a little booth and even despite Jonah's attitude and sulking God shows him mercy and causes a plant to grow up over him and to give him shade and we read that Jonah loved the plant he was so grateful for it it gave him shade he loved that comfort that was given to him we see God's sovereignty it was God that prepared this plant to grow. And then at dawn the next day, God prepared a worm to devour the plant that he had grown. And then we read that God prepared an east wind to beat down upon Nineveh and to blast Jonah as he now sat scorched by the sun. Again, we see God is sovereign over all things. What do I mean by God is sovereign? I mean that God ordains all things which come to pass. God is not a genie in a lamp that we have to rub the right way in order to get him to do what we want. Many Christians today will say they believe in the sovereignty of God. Oh yes, God is sovereign. But when pressed, you find out really that they believe that they are sovereign. They believe that they rule in life. God is simply there like a genie to do as they please. And when he doesn't, they get rather angry with him. God is sovereign. Even over the trials in life. It was God that destroyed the comfort that he had given to Jonah. It it was God who sent the east wind. Firstly, I want to focus on that plant. Because that plant speaks of every comfort that you've been given in life. Everything that brings you joy in life. Everything that brings you satisfaction and happiness is just like that plant. It was given to you. You didn't work for it. You didn't earn it. It was given to you by God. You certainly didn't deserve it. Every blessing that we have in life, our children, our homes, our jobs, the things that we love, they're all just like that gourd, that plant that grew up. God has given them to you as a blessing and as a comfort. To shelter you, though, you didn't deserve it. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Truly, whatever blessings you have, and are given in this life, they don't truly belong to us. They don't. They belong to God. And as the book of Job says, he's able to give them, and he's able to take them away. Job, in the first chapter of that book, after everything is taken from him, he says, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We're not to be like Jonah and to hold on to the blessings that we've been given and comforts and when they are taken away to get angry at God. How dare you? I'm so cross with you, I just want to die. What's the point in life now? If I can't enjoy my comforts and my blessings, what's life about? I want to say to you, the purpose in life is the glory of God. That's the purpose in your life. Westminster Confession says it so well. What is the chief end of mankind? To glorify God and to enjoy him 
forever. Jonah got this mixed up. He had figured that the main point of his life was his satisfaction, his comfort, his blessing. We must remember this, brothers and sisters. Those comforts that God gives us, they belong to him. We are to be continually great, grateful for them. But always remember that they truly belong to him. Why did God then take this comfort away from Jonah? How harsh, how mean. Is God like some big giant in the sky squishing ants for fun? It's often how people feel about God, isn't it? They don't give God a second thought until suffering touches their lives. And then, I hate God. But that's not why God took that plant away from Jonah. God's not a sadist in the sky. He's a loving father. And Jonah was being overcome. Overcome by selfishness. His heart was in danger of being overtaken by lies. In taking that plant away from Jonah, in taking that comfort away from him, God again was showing him what had happened with Nineveh. Jonah became a picture of Nineveh again. God showed him favor and blessing, though he did not deserve it. God only ever takes away in order to save us, in, a, in order to deliver us, in order to strengthen us and conform us into God's image more and more. In closing, I want to remind you of another parable. It's the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18. This is the parable that really does seem to me to tie in with this final chapter in Jonah. Let me read it to you. Matthew 18, 23 to 35. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. You should, not have had, should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant? as I had mercy on you. In closing, there's two things to say. Firstly, every day remind yourself that you are that servant. That you have been forgiven much. That I have been forgiven much. How then can I withhold forgiveness from others? Secondly, this, that you're never too far from God's saving grip. No matter how bad your life has gotten, no matter how much of a mess you've made, if God can save Nineveh, he can save you. I'd like to ask you to stand. Let's pray. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. Father God, we pray today that you would do a work in us afresh. I know that there are people in this room who do struggle to forgive because they've been hurt greatly and Lord we remember that you grieve with those who have been hurt 
You heard the cries of your people in Egypt as they were under the yoke of slavery. And so, Lord, let us remember today that you are always mindful and compassionate in our sufferings, especially when we've been wronged. But, Lord, help us also to remember that as you have forgiven us much, we too are to forgive others much. Lord, help us to be like Corrie ten Boom, who forgave the man who had treated us so horribly in Ravensbrück. Help us too to offer the right hand of fellowship and of grace to those who have wronged us in this life, just as you have forgiven us in Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.